Miracy. What's the truth of what's going on right now? What do you see right in front of you? What's another way for you to relate to it? And we're off and running. We're back into creativity. And they're going to invite the change they want. Hello, I'm Melinda Cohen, and you're listening to Just Between Coaches. I run a business called The Coaches Console, and we're proud to have helped more than 70,000 coaches create profitable and thriving businesses. This is a podcast where we answer burning questions that newer coaches would love to ask a more experienced coach. All coaching is about learning, growing, and change. And to do that, we help our clients see and identify the choices that they need to make. We give our clients agency to make those choices and ripple that into all parts of their lives. Now, I've worked with a coach and as a coach for 18 years with Coaches Console and 20 years since I started my own business. And I've helped many clients go through transformation and implement change. And I know for new coaches, it can feel like a tall order to handle change within themselves, within their business, as well as for their clients. It's easy to fall prey to that internal judgmental self-talk, not realizing that judgment is an excellent way to invite change. And I'm going to talk to someone that is an expert at inviting change. Today, I've brought Janet Harvey into the conversation. Janet is the CEO of Invite Change, a coaching and human development organization that shapes a world where people love their life's work. She's written the best-selling and award-winning leadership and coaching book, Invite Change, Lessons from 2020, The Year of No Return. Janet is a visionary leader. She's a coach and an educator and speaker who invites people to be the cause of the life that most matters to you. She is bold, curious, provocative, articulate, and a compassionate human being. Welcome, Janet. (laughs) Thank you, Melinda. It's such a delight to have this quality of time with you after all these years. Very wonderful. I know. We have known each other for a long Mm -hmm. time. I was trying to think back when we met each other, and I can't even trace it back, but it's been like way back in the early days. But before we dive in, would you mind sharing a little bit of background with how you started Invite Change? Sure. I'm happy to do that. I was um, on a pretty traditional professional path, working in financial services and had worked my way into an executive leader position and was working in the space of change because I seem to have never had any trouble with it. <laughs> I, I'm I'm one of those people who's fairly fearless about life, and um, what a blessing for sure. But that's not true for most people. Coaching was just beginning to get defined as a thing. It was like the beginnings of teen coaching, which is really where my my passion started. I I often do things a little bass backwards. I did teen coaching before I did one on one coaching, <laughs> and you know, and ICF was starting to form, and I went, you know what? I think I'm kind of done with this corporate thing. I want to go be an entrepreneur and and uh, live more into the provocateur in me that uh, likes to blow up the status quo. I'm not the person you hire if you want things to continue along as they always have. <laughs> That's not my MO. Well, I love how you just said that, to live more into the provocateur in me. As soon as I hear that, I'm like, well, yes, I would like that. And then I'm like, wait, what is, hold on a second. Because in your book, you talk about how we must intentionally invite change. Talk more about that. I really, I've come to dislike this metaphor, but it's still very illustrative, which is the boiling frog. The frog's in the water and the water's getting a little hotter. And then I don't have enough leg muscle to get out of the water when it's too hot and I'm going to go away. Inviting change is about recognizing my frog self knows how to jump from pad to pad. And my frog self knows how to have joy. I can swim and I can be on land. I have a lot of capability. And that means that even though I'm feeling accomplished in one place, I can feel accomplished again because I got to that one place. What I'm describing is a mindset shift. Everybody has everything necessary to create the life they want. 
They don't pause to ask about it. And that's the first step. If we pause and ask ourselves, who is it that I want to be? What's the company I want to keep? What are the places that I've always longed to go? What in me is saying no? There's got to be a voice that said yes. I said yes before. What could I say yes to now? All of what I'm modeling here is the invitation process. I'm not there yet, right? I haven't taken the risk to uh, dive into the deep end. But I've activated something original in my own system that, that can begin to connect to some wonder. And this is when change becomes an adventure instead of the place of uncertainty, because we get our mind's eye wrapped around what that new experience could be in really um, palpable, specific, particular language. And it activates all of the neurochemicals necessary to express ourselves and do it with courage, even in the face of other people doubting our, our desire to want to have something be different. Okay, I feel like that was just a mic drop right there. Like I, <laughs> I, I mean, I know the work you do. And I want to just talk about that last thing that you said. It activates the neurochemical necessary for that change to come about. Because I was just talking with a group of folks. We just had an event and a lot of newer coaches were there. And, you know, they're in this place of stress, overwhelm, anxiety around their business. A, and B, beginning to coach people. They're brand new at this. We'll just talk about new coaches for a few minutes. And so when they're in this anxiety stress, like they're running adrenaline and it's the chemicals running through their body that keep them slowed down, bogged down, reactionary, kind of self-protective. And what you just described by act, by pausing to be curious about it within yourself or within your clients, you're activating something that connects to wonder. And then you move into place of adventure instead of place of uncertainty. And now you're activating different neurochemicals, the endorphins, the dopamines, those life supporting chemicals that tap into our creativity, that help us uh, accomplish more while doing less, that help us leverage our talents and skills instead of struggle against them. So talk more about that because I love this topic. <laughs> well, and you've captured it quite beautifully. Thank you. I think that pause is very underrated. <laughs> and yet for the parents who are listening to this podcast, you'll remember that when a child throws a temper tantrum, it's because they've been overstimulated and they don't yet have the internal systems that can manage that themselves. And what do we do? We have a child sit in low light we put them against a plain wall so their eyes don't have to focus on anything and they're sitting and we're near them. And it takes eight seconds. That's all. It takes only eight seconds and the parasympathetic system comes to the rescue. <laughs> and then that child, we can look them in the eye and say, you're okay. Everything is just fine. I'm here, I love you, all is well. Now, of course, there are kids who don't get the benefit of that, but I use that specifically because that's the time of life when we learn how to self-regulate and we get better and better at it over time as we put ourselves in the places and with the people that care about us. So the mechanism to pause the chaos does not take a long time, very short period of time. We have to remember to do it. We remember to do it because we create that experience with intent. I want the experience of calm. I want the experience of being able to connect to my own inner capacity and resource to regulate my life. Now, how do I do that? I'm starting to learn in my life what are the practices that help me pause connect to myself, allow myself to rest, fill up my gas tank, get a little restored so that I'm ready to go. These are all practices. We can learn to do them. We don't have to live in the habit and preference of go, 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 go. Who said that was the human rhythm? Oh my goodness. If we don't pause, the limbic brain takes over and says everything is dangerous. Everything is risky. 
And that's protection is the coping mechanism for that. So as adults, we learn to manage that by short circuiting. Pause is undervalued. If we could simply help people remember eight seconds, that's all it takes. I love the eight seconds. A lot of times I hear newer coaches because I talk about the world I think the industry is in right now, as I call it, the results revolution. And that mainstream, I think it has gone mainstream and that everyday buyer is requiring results when they invest and say, yes, I want to work with a coach. I have to have outcomes. And with that, newer coaches, they're saying things like, oh my gosh, I don't think I can coach my clients to get results. I don't think I can get my clients there. And and they're doubting their own ability. So how can we help our clients? And especially for those newer coaches that are listening in and coaching our clients, uh, getting them to that place of transformation. Can you share a little bit about that? All right. Well, you invited this provocateur to your podcast. So (laughs) here you go. (laughs) Hit it, sister. (laughs) You can't get anyone anywhere. Get. Get is the word to withdraw out of the vocabulary. Now, what do I mean by that? This This is really why coaching has been exploding on the scene. Effective professional coaches activate, catalyze, illuminate, empower, not from their expertise, not from their history, not from the tool bag that they're carrying, that they hand over, not from the methodology that they've spent gobs of hours producing so they could differentiate themselves. None of that stuff is the master. They're all supportive. They're, they're, they're useful in the expression of who you are as a human being and as a professional. But the moment of truth comes in that interaction with the client, being completely client-centered to say, I have no idea who you are and I will never learn enough about you to know more than you know yourself. You may not believe that right now, client. But what I do very well is I will listen on your behalf 100%. And because I can hear what you won't let yourself hear and reflect it back to you, and I can challenge your habits and preferences and assumptions, which you won't do because you're very comfortable where you are, sort of, in our interaction, which is a safe partnership over time, you have the opportunity to remember you can create something different. You can produce a different result than the one you're doing right now, one that's better, one that's the thing that's expected of you, the one that is the stretch beyond what you think is possible. My responsibility is to create the space for you to do that reflection and powerful thinking. I don't live in your day-to-day. You do. I get to see you once a week, maybe once every other week. Well, you'll leave our sessions with is the confidence and the access to how you manifest those outcomes. That's your job, client, is to manifest those outcomes. Our job in our partnership is for you to imagine and create and learn and produce your own pathway. The one you can't see right now without the benefit of the dialogue we will have. Okay, for all of our newer coaches listening in, rewind, listen to that again, rewind, listen to it again, bookmark it, and just keep playing that over and over and over. Uh, Because that is, I mean, to show up as a coach, that's exactly how that's done. And I love how you said, you know, as effective coaches, we activate, we we catalyze, we illuminate, uh, we empower from the way that we show up, not what we do or what we bring to the table, but surely just from the way that we show up. Now, when we talk about uh, inviting change, whether it's with ourself or we're holding that space for our clients to invite change in whatever we're coaching them in, whatever world we're working in, you also have a TEDx talk about how judgment is key to invite change. And you say, you know, we're always judging. How is that a key part of inviting change. This has been an area of reflection for me for many years now. As your listeners 
get introduced to me and learn about me, they're going to see that I have a birthmark on my face. And so very early on in my life, I learned that what people say and what they do are often quite different. And as I started to understand that the difference came in their meaning making, what meaning they made of what they were perceiving, I started to realize, okay, well, mine's an obvious thing, but what do people do when they're meeting someone and the difference isn't quite so obvious? Why do they end up having so much difficulty with each other? And of course, we've all learned the rule that, you know, you should be non-judgmental or at least you should suspend judgment until you have some reason to not like somebody. I mean, even that is hard. It's like chalk on a blackboard for me to hear. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started thinking about this. And in our coach training program, we talk about notice judgment, pause to listen a little deeper and practice unconditional curiosity, meaning What's the question you want to ask this person who has disrupted you? You're feeling judgmental. You're like, oh, I don't agree with that. I don't like that. That's crazy. Where did that come from? If you can catch the moment when you're being judgmental, pause and take a breath. Let the parasympathetic system calm down and realize, you know what? This person might know something or have an experience in their history that I don't. So. When I did the TED Talk, it was an opportunity to say, judgment is as natural to the human condition as breathing. It's how we make meaning out of things. It's how we stay safe. It's how we, it's how we evaluate. Is this okay for me to take this risk or not? We don't want to make judgment the enemy. And yes, being judgmental uh, unconsciously, out of habit, making somebody wrong or less than ourselves in order for us to feel well, good about ourselves, that's us being judgmental with us. We don't feel good enough about us, so we got to make somebody else less than? Wait a minute. The person isn't who I have a problem with. It might be the idea, but maybe I don't actually see the situation completely. This happens all the time in coach-client relationships where clients will say something and we're thinking to ourselves, where in the world did they get that from? And that's the moment I'm being judgmental. If I can catch that and pause and keep listening to the client a little longer, the more they talk, the more I realize, you know what? Their words don't match their actions. There's a, something a little inconsistent or incongruent. And now I have a question I can ask. Client, how do you reconcile this and that, which you just spoke as one path for this thing you're wanting to pursue. And they'll look at us with a stare and say, I had no idea I, I said both those things, right? Yeah, so maybe we found the place where you have passed judgment on something that's out of date. It doesn't suit anymore. What's the truth of what's going on right now? What do you see right in front of you? What's another way for you to relate to it? And we're off and running. We're back into creativity. And they're going to invite the change they want. I love that clarity and the simplicity of how you bring that judgment in. So it's a tool. It's not a thing that we have to work against or, oh my gosh, I better not do that. Or like, I think you said, see it as an enemy, but it can be that tool. Uh, and you also talk about three internal practices that help us realize that judgment serves as the way to invite change. Is that when you were talking about the that pause and the breathing or how do you how do we recognize this within ourselves? So, um the three words are notice, name and negotiate. And in all things that we want to learn about and grow and make changes in our lives, noticing is a micro skill that we really need to give permission to ourselves to have. Unfortunately, our brain kind of works against us since we've had the neuroscience in the space. Let's add this one in too. Our brains uh, are natural habit-forming machines because it's an energy conservation. The reticular activating system in the brain, it's part of the limbic um, system, is seeking pattern. And it says, oh, when Janet does this, this is a common response. It gives us a good result. So we're going to put that in the habit machine. And anytime we see something similar to it, we're going to give her the impulse to the habit. Now, 
if I decide I want to change, I am going to be working against that ingrained habit, just the nature of it. So how do we do it? Well, if I can notice that I am in a situation and I'm about to take a step forward and realize, but that's not the intention I set. It's not what I said I wanted. I'm going to step back. Let me pause and count to three and notice that I made a quick assessment of what was going on in front of me. And I didn't ask any questions. (laughs) I've done this so many times and we're always going to do it. So we can't make the fact that we're feeling judgmental the enemy. We need to embrace it and go, oh, there it is. I, my habit took charge again, but I stopped. So this time I'm going to give myself credit for that. It's important to examine where did the habit come from? And here I really do mean all four, the habit, the assumption, the preference, the bias, whatever it is. Where did it arise from? When did I acquire that way of walking in the world? What was going on at that stage in my life that that's what I acquired? Do I really need the belief that I'm operating from? What's my professional worth? What's my personal worth? And how do I stand for it? This is such a big piece for newer coaches who are building a practice, right? There's a business to run. There's an entrepreneur to be. And if we can't be at home in ourselves and say, I'm worth it, we're not going to show up with clients in a credible way to help them say that to themselves with the change they want. So noticing the beliefs and the life history that has us trapped in an out-of-date mindset of who we are and what we're capable of. When we notice the judgment, it's the first step of going, oh, that's where that came from. Hmm. Interesting. Is it true now? What's the evidence that makes that true now? And most of the time, I find there is no evidence. (laughs) <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, that's my, that's the wrong prescription lenses to put on. Let me take these glasses off and see what's right in front of me. And as I look, maybe for the first time in a long time, to see what is actually happening, now I have a fresh landscape to negotiate. What is it I want? That requires exercising judgment. I need to discern. I need to use some critical thinking and say, what do I value? What's respectful of me and other that are involved in whatever it is I'm doing? I mean, I've had executives who were just really like, like out of their wits, frustrated with somebody on their team. And I'm, I'm thinking about a clinical a physician leader who had all these complaints coming in about one of the docs on the team not not showing up for his um, emergency ro- uh, room rotations. And um, we'd had this conversation. And so he called the doc into his room and he said, you know, I'm, I'm noticing that your um, usual reliability and collegiality with the other docs is a little off right now. And I'm wondering what's up for you? which is what we'd been working on, just a simple, personal conversation. And the guy took a long, long, deep breath, and he said, "Uh, six weeks ago, my son was diagnosed with uh, bone cancer, and we have been going absolutely crazy trying to find the right treatment for him, and we're still not there. And I haven't told anybody because I don't have any answers, and how could I be a clinician and not have any answers? Wow. That's what was going on. Wow. So the ability to have the judgment but not succumb to it, to notice and name, he could name his frustration and realize, you know what, there's more to the story here. Let me go negotiate this relationship and see what's there to learn. And these are, you know, these are life practices. They're, of course, very empowering from a coaching point of view. But for every one of us to soften the need to defend our position so we can hear each other, that's my wish. And I think it's, we have to do this work for ourselves constantly. I mean, the 18 years, 20 years that I've had my own business, it's never ending work. We have to make that commitment to our growth and expansion as coaches so that we can continue to serve our clients and navigate this spot with ourselves and with them. Now, I just want to summarize some of the stuff that we talked about today. Because you talked about, well, the dynamic world that we live in, right? It's our our tried and true methods 
they're not always going to work effectively. And so we have to be intentional about inviting change and recognizing, remembering that, oh yeah, I do know how to go to the next thing. I've created capability here in this one area. I can do it again, but we have to have that mindset shift and how important the pause is. I think one of the top takeaways, it only takes eight seconds. It just takes eight seconds. And when we can remember that, when we can get curious about that with ourselves and for our clients, we activate that different way of interacting and engaging with ourselves and those around us. Now change becomes an adventure, not an uncertainty. And I loved that eight seconds. I I loved how you shared. Uh, you can't get anyone anywhere. So for all of our newer, for any coach, whenever we you know, sometimes even as established coaches, we have a bad day and we forget this ourselves. And it's like, oh yeah, (laughs) it's not my job to get you there. It's not my job to get you the outcomes, but it is my job to hold the space, to create the container, to listen on your behalf, to ask the questions that need to be asking. And that's where we can activate and catalyze our clients from that spot. And then also I loved the conversation about judging and how it's not an enemy but we can leverage it as a tool to take us deeper with our own self-work or the work we're doing with our own coach and how we're working with our clients as a place of exploration and curiosity rather than judgment and separateness. Janet, do you have any parting words on this topic that you want to share with our listeners? So this question is what I would leave with everyone because it has been incredibly deepening for me to understand the concept in my mind that I am an unlimited human, that it's my thought patterns, my values and beliefs and my frame of reference and my attitude, these all influence whether I do things deliberately or out of habit. And if I'm going to break that thought pattern of habit and do things in the moment, spontaneously appropriate to the context I find myself in, I have got to know what I think my fully potent self is. And then I need to know, okay, what crops up to stop me from living fully potent every day? And that's the inquiry question. What stops me from living fully potent every day? Because the reflection time on that question helps me see all the places where I've fallen into my habits or I acquired some new ones and they aren't working. (laughs) (laughs) Like, you know, I've said to myself, hey, I'm going to make 10 sales calls today and I don't make a single one for five days. All right. I could be really mad at myself for that. Or I could look and see what did I do instead? What stopped me from living into that goal that I set for myself? What about that was appropriate? What about that was hiding behind something? Whatever it is, the reflection on what stops me from being fully potent today, it helps me do the inventory because the goal's not wrong. It simply wasn't going to fit. And I can't make myself the enemy because all I got when I got up in the morning looking in the mirror was me. So the question and reflection time is what helps me calibrate continuously. And I would offer that to everyone as something that we all have a responsibility. If we want to live our lives and maximize our potential, we have to examine where we get in our own way with the heart of the creator and invite the change we want. Beautiful. Thank you for listening to this episode of Just Between Coaches. And also a big thank you to Janet for this amazing conversation about inviting change. You can find out more about her at invitechange.com. That's invitechange.com. Janet, thank you so much for coming to the show. And delight to be with you and to share this with all of your audience and the new audience to come. I'm Melinda Cohen, and you've been listening to Just Between Coaches. Just Between Coaches is part of the Mirror CFM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Making It and Course Lab. This episode was produced by Cynthia Lamb. I wrote this episode with Mishi Lance. She assembled the episode. Danny Eni is our executive producer, and post-production was by Post Office Sound. To follow upcoming great episodes on Just Between Coaches, please follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening right now. 
And if you like the show, please leave us a starred review. It's the best way to help us get these ideas to more people.